Greetings. This is part two of a two-part series entitled Sidekick Survival Skills for Faculty, behind the scenes tips to make your online course successful. I'm Liz Weiss, Director of Education at the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. By the end of this webinar, our promise to you is that you will be able to develop a template within your learning management system. Describe components of universal design. Discuss ADA compliance issues. Examine copyright fair use considerations. And identify ways to calculate seat time workload. Number of you had questions on the last webinar about those very items. The presenters encourage you at any time throughout the event to join in questions, comments about the topics that they're covering. On your screen, the Q&A box there in your task panel. You click on that and then type your question or comment into the box there. I'd also like to mention they have three polls throughout the webinar to figure out where you're coming from. So you might wanna stay close to your device so you could just tap in your responses to the polls. I'm pleased to welcome our moderator for today, Mary Catherine McNatt. Department Chair and Associate Professor at A.T. Still University, College of Graduate Health Studies. She has been involved in online teaching and course development for over a decade and enjoys striving toward keeping courses innovated and experiential. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McNatt to the mic. Thank you, Liz. Today I have the honor of introducing you to Sue and Susan, two of our wonderful instructional designers from A.T. Still College of Graduate Health Studies. Both have been instructional designers for over 10 years. They work very closely with our MPH courses and are familiar with CEEF competency alignment, ADA compliance, and all the behind the scene issues, which they're going to talk to you about today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to them. Ladies? Right, I think I have control. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liz and Mary Catherine. Um, welcome to Sidekick Survival Skills for Faculty. You know, behind every good superhero is the person in the background making sure things run smoothly. Batman and Robin had Alfred, Superman had Jimmy Olsen. But for some undergraduate and graduate faculty transitioning to remote learning, you kind of had to assume both roles. So, um, Give yourself some props. If you happen to have instructional designers available at your institution, please don't be afraid to use them. They want to help you in any way they can and they will be your most trusted sidekick. So at our school, we use a standard template for all courses. This creates consistency both within a course and between courses. This allows our course developers to focus on what's most important, the content and flow of the course not the structure. This also helps reduce not only development time, but rework time when courses are revised. Our template also helps us ensure good design practices are followed. Our template was initially designed to meet quality matters standards. Through the, pro the process of completing nearly 60 QM course reviews during this academic year, uh, we've made a few tweaks to the template and a few other standardized pieces and all but one of the courses we've put through the QM process has passed. That's a pretty good track record. So templates benefit students as well by reducing the cognitive load and anxiety of beginning a new course. Students know where to look for course components like the syllabus or the instructor's contact information, supplemental materials, their grades, and they know to, where to look for this from one course to the next. This again allows them to focus on what's most important the content. So here's a peek at our standard course template, and this is the student's view of a course. The same menu choices appear on the left side of every course. As the menu items are needed or discarded, they're removed from the template. We also make sure to add them into existing course masters. So if any of this in the template appeals to you, please feel free to steal it, borrow it, whatever. We are extremely happy to share. Uh, the top section is the same for every course. This is where a student can go to find out who the instructor is, how to contact them, and then find links to important information like CGHS student resources and 
university services like the library and the university writing center. We also have two course long discussion forums noted there in the middle, the coffee shop and ask your instructor. Uh, the coffee shop is for student introductions and for non course related discussions between students. I had a class create their own knitting club through this forum. The ask your instructor instructor forum is for course related questions. So if a student has a question about course content, it's likely that others have the same question. So we encourage students to ask here. The instructor can answer once and everyone gets the same information or sometimes students can even answer questions. There's also an assignment drafts feature. This allows a student to submit an assignment to turn it in and get a preliminary match score before they need to submit the assignment. They can go back and make their adjustments. These are not stored in the Turnitin database. Also, if a course is Quality Matter certified, we post it here with a separate line and a link to the certification information on the QM pages. So farther down the page, we have the individual course modules. Our courses are 10 weeks long, so we have one module per week. The course has a pre-course, this course in particular, has a pre-course survey that students must complete before they have access to the rest of the course. And we use adaptive release to ensure this. If you look on the right hand side of each one of those modules, uh, it says prerequisite pre-course survey. By expanding each module, you can see the various standard components, introduction, learning activities, and assessments. Every module has an introduction to let students know what topics will be in the module and why this is important for them to know. This is similar to how you would start a face-to-face -face class. You don't just start lecturing, you set the stage for the students. This is where the instructor or course developer really gets to shine and share their love of the subject with the students. This helps them make the connection to why the students need this information. The next is the learning activities, which to us means all the things the student has to read, watch, listen to, or explore in order to get the information they need. This could be textbook readings, journal articles, web articles, government professional websites, um, videos, podcasts, and more. Finally, the assessments. Assessment to, any, to us is anything that is graded and we, we require something graded every week in order to meet federal financial aid guidelines. All of our courses a few years back used to have a discussion and a paper every week. Can you imagine how much fun that was for the students or even the instructors? We've since, since branched out to all sorts of assessments. We still use discussions and papers, but now we have things like self-check quizzes that are very low stakes assessments, writing assignments targeted to specific audiences, such as the letter to the editor here, or memos or research briefs. We also have students create videos, make presentations, create infographics, compose social media posts, and tweets, and more. Sometimes we even let them choose how they're going to demonstrate that knowledge. Speaking of flexibility and letting them uh, choose how they display their knowledge of a topic, let's talk a little bit about universal design. According to the Center for Excellence in Universal Design, universal design, which we commonly refer to as UDL, is the design and composition of an environment so that it can be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability, or disability. An environment should be designed to meet the needs of all people who wish to use it. So this is not a special requirement for the benefit of only a minority of the population. It's a fundamental condition of good design. If an environment is accessible, usable, convenient, and a pleasure to use, everyone benefits. By considering the diverse needs and abilities of all throughout the design process, Universal Design creates products, services, and environments that meets people's needs. Simply put, Universal Design is good design.
There are seven overarching principles of universal design. And the purpose of these principles is really to guide your course design and your communications with students. So the first principle is equitable use. In this case, equitable use means your course design is useful to people with diverse abilities. We should strive to provide the same means of use for all users, identical whenever possible and equitable when not. Your course design should strive to be appealing to all users. Principle two involves flexibility in use. Your course design should accommodate a wide range of individual preferences and abilities wherever possible. This goes back to what Sue was saying earlier in allowing students to select the manner in which they display their knowledge of a subject. So when possible, provide choice in methods of use. In a face-to-face -face setting, you may want to, for example, accommodate a right and left-handed access in use. Also provide adaptability to the user's pace when possible. Um, an example of adaptability and pace would be competency-based education or adaptive learning platforms. Both of these concepts provide a level of adaptability to the user's pace. Within competency-based education, or CBE for short, you will see students test out of content in which they have prior knowledge. They are allowed to move on. With adaptive learning platforms, students are taken through branch scenarios, and if they're not understanding the content, they may be taken down a remedial pathway for additional support on a topic. Principle three involves simple and intuitive use. So the design should be easy to understand, regardless of the user's experience, their knowledge, language skills, or current concentration level. In your course content, eliminate unnecessary complexity whenever possible. Be consistent with user expectations and the intuition of the way you have your course laid out. Try to accommodate a wide range of literacy and language skills. So for example, at ATSU, we have quite a few graduate students who have English as a second language. Um, if you can, arrange information in a consistent, um, careful manner and provide effective prompting and feedback during and after a student completes a task. Principle four relates to perceptible information. So the design of your course should communicate necessary information effectively to the user regardless of the ambient conditions or the user's sensory ability. Um, when possible, use different modes. So pictures versus videos um, versus maybe some hands-on in a lab type situation. So for redundant presentation of essential information, that can be very important. Some learners, for example, are visual while others are auditory. So offering them a podcast and a video as an option gives them on that same concept, gives those learners multiple opportunities to learn the information. Principle five addresses tolerance for error and your course design should minimize the hazards and the adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. For example, making your course structure consistent helps them stay on the path to successful completion. Principle six refers to low physical effort. Now, a course should be designed to be used efficiently and comfortable with a minimum of fatigue. In an online course, consider using good color contrast to reduce eye strain. Other ways you can promote this principle would be to minimize repetitive actions, such as scrolling and scrolling down a page to find information. Finally, we come to principle seven, size and space for approach and use. So at first glance, this may seem more evident in a face-to-face -face classroom, but there are elements that can also apply online. A good use of white space or dividers keep sections clean and draw the student's attention where it's desired. Let's look at how course design, layout, and navigation can impact that user's experience. So have you ever become frustrated while visiting a website because you couldn't find information that you knew 
must be there. Such experiences often result from the site author not taking into account how the end user will actually use the site. So a course or website design should be user driven. A site must be designed in a way that anticipates what you're going to look for and how you are going to look for it. The essence of user centered or universal design. Including everything you have on a topic can be overwhelming. Can you imagine trying to read through all of this information on this website? I get a headache just looking at this page. There are way too many fonts, no color scheme, floating words and icons, flashing words. Uh, the list of tragedies goes on and on with this site. Now imagine if this was your course and your course looked like this. Where would students go first? You might actually find a pattern in all the chaos eventually, but I think most people would click away in horror within about two seconds. Overwhelming is an understatement. Uh, we use consistent color scheme based upon our university colors and many universities have a brand, a brand guide that will help guide you and give you the color schemes. We also try to use sans serif fonts the ones that don't have the little flourishes on the letters, that makes it easier to read on devices. We also try to stick to only one font and avoid cutting and pasting from Word. If you've ever done that, um, regardless of your LMS, you may find that you end up with something called ransom note font in your online course. And you end up having to spend extra time trying to get it out of the course itself. Um, also try to avoid underlining words for emphasis because that often looks like it's a link. Chunking information helps users as well and it helps them remember content. We talked about chunking the other day, um, but chunking involves writing short chunks of information, five to seven minutes or so, providing transitions between those short chunks, linking all of the chunks together in a meaningful way, and reinforcing that with learning activities such as videos or quizzes. Predictability is also important. Once you create your course, have someone else review it for usability. Can they find everything easily? How many clicks does it take to locate an item? Before we go on, I do wanna talk for a minute about clicks. So specifically how many clicks it takes to find information. There used to be this rule that um, everything had to be within three clicks of a website, in this case, a course, from the home page. Can you imagine what a nightmare that could be for some websites? I think that site located on the last slide would be an, would be an example of a three-click rule horror. Um, however, usability experts have found as long as the user feels like they're on the right path, um, that they're on the scent of the information, they'll keep clicking. So in the end, it's about making a course easy to read and use. Universal design is good design. Yes, it is. And accessibility is a hot topic, and it should be. If your course site is not accessible, you're opening yourself and your institution to a lawsuit. There have been several schools sued, and they've lost because their websites and courses were not accessible to those with disabilities. In fact, recently MIT and Harvard both lost video transcript lawsuits because they were using auto captioning like you see in a lot of YouTube videos, which is not always accurate. You know, going back to uh, what Susan said with universal design, you know, identical when it can be, equitable when it's not. So. Most people think about making content available to those who have visual or auditory impairments. You know, my brother-in-law is deaf, so this is kind of a hot topic for me. But disabilities are more than that. What about a paraplegic taking a course who has limited manual mobility? What about a student with test anxiety or a learning disorder that requires a screen reader? You don't always see the disability, and that's even more true online. There are lots of accessibility checkers on the web. Um, if you just Google accessibility checker, you'll find lots of information. 
One of my favorites is WAVE, which originated at Utah State University. Additionally, most of your learning management systems also have built-in accessibility checkers. If you're not sure if it's available or you need to know how to use it, check with your LMS administrator. So now we're going to talk a little bit about naming conventions, which um, is also an area to enhance ADA compliance, because how you name a link can be interpreted very differently by screen readers. So um, at this time, I think Aaron's going to open up our poll. Um, we've got four samples here of text that could be used in a course, and which of these would be ADA compliant? So if you would just click your choice or choices. We'll see what you guys think. Are we close, Aaron? Okay, it looks like the majority of you thought that number three was compliant, followed by number one. Well, you're partially right. Although they may seem correct, only three and four are ADA compliant. Number three places the link within a sentence, and this option should only be used for really short links. Um, number four increases readability, especially with longer website links, because that text would be the part that the user clicks on. And when the screen reader gets to it, the uh, user can hit their enter key or click on it and they know that that's where they'll be going. Um, number one and two do not lend support for learners who have a screen reader. All right, so um, we all use Microsoft Office, I'm sure we do, um, and all the products have a built-in accessibility checker. Here's a screenshot of a document created for one of our classes. On the left, you can see the document, and on the right, you can see the items that need to be fixed. In this case, the image at the top of the page needs an alt tag. This tag allows a screen reader to tell the user what the image is. In this case, I filled in the alt tag with the words ATSU.CGHS logo and then added the description. This is a university logo for AT Still University and the College of Graduate Health Studies. And that would be read to the user by the screen reader. There's also a table that needs an alt tag to describe its contents and the table needs a header row specified. The nice thing about this accessibility checker is that it will tell you what needs to be fixed and then tell you how to fix it. And if you can't find the accessibility checker for your version, use the little um, words up above that say, tell me what you want to do or something similar near the top of the page. And Adobe Acrobat Pro also has a built-in accessibility checker to make sure your PDF files are accessible. It's located in the tools area. After running the accessibility check, the issues needing addressed are displayed in the left side panel. I know it probably looks a little scary, but again, the nice thing is Adobe holds your hand to walk you through the process of correcting these. You just click on the little icon at the top of the panel, and here you can choose to fix, skip, or ask for an explanation of the er error. When you choose fix, Acrobat provides form fields you can fill in to help improve the accessibility of your document. In this case, the document needs a title, and then you can add a subject or appropriate keywords, and those things can be even more beneficial to someone needing an accessible document. Um, some of these built-in accessibility checkers will also help check the order the items on the page are displayed and read. This is very important to someone who can't see or someone who can't control a mouse. Make sure that the order makes sense. Every computer, whether Windows or Mac, has a built-in screen reader, and I encourage you to find yours and use it to check your documents and course pages. 
especially like we talked about the last in the last slide, the order in which they're read, you'll be able to hear that. Um, just make sure that you know where to find the off switch because I've had it stick and not been able to get it turned off and it'll drive me crazy. <laughs> uh, make sure that every video that you use in your course has caption, closed captions or transcripts. And that means even those quick little videos that you post as announcements. Um, closed captions or transcripts aren't just for those who have hearing impairments. Think about the student who has to do coursework late at night, maybe while others are sleeping or even in a noisy environment. Being able to read what's being said on the screen lets them get the full experience too. And all audio components need to have a transcript as well. Creating your transcript before recording will help you come across as more polished and professional. If you can't create it ahead of time, you can use a transcription service to transcribe your audio or video for you. And some of these services are relatively inexpensive and definitely much cheaper than a lawsuit. Color blindness is an issue that's often forgotten about, but it's vitally important. This graphic shows you the normal spectrum of colors across the top and what various degrees of color blindness see instead of that same spectrum. And it's really different for some of them. So don't only use color to emphasize important points. For instance, if you want to emphasize a deadline in your text, you can put it in red, but also make it bold so it stands out for someone who can't see red. If you use a pie chart to illustrate a concept, consider using patterns to help differentiate, differentiate the sections as well as color. Because colorblind users have a particularly hard time with red and green combos, but too little contrast or too much contrast causes eye strain for everyone. Sometimes simple is best. Uh, so consider using black or dark gray on a white or a light background for optimum viewing. It's easier to read for those who have vision issues and creates less eye strain for those who don't. If you notice, the majority of this presentation is done using black text on a white background. All right, well, thank you, Sue, for talking about accessibility. Now we're gonna shift gears a little bit to another topic that is near and dear to us as instructional designers, and we get a lot of questions about it. It's copyright and fair use. So while there are many copyright exceptions afforded educational institutions, restrictions to these exceptions do exist and often change according to the situation. Uh, as a result, copyright really must be approached differently for face-to-face -face instruction as opposed to distance instruction. Now we will detail policies and strategies for copyrighted material used by instructors in both cases. So just a quick disclaimer, none of us on this panel are attorneys and therefore if you have a specific situation in which you're seeking legal advice regarding copyright, um, we ask that you seek that advice of an attorney who specializes in copyright law. Our information is more general in nature um, but should help you make more informed decisions with regards to copyright. I think you'll find that in most cases, the answer to your questions regarding copyright are not necessarily straightforward. I find myself saying it depends a lot when answering questions regarding copyright. Uh, many times the judgment call regarding what is acceptable and what, what is not is left in the hands of a judge and each judge may have a different interpretation of what is acceptable use and what isn't. Um, higher education institutions and instructional designers such as Sue and myself constantly monitor lawsuits in the news to ensure that we are staying abreast of recent developments in an effort to do our due diligence. Um, let's take a look now at some typical situations in which you might have some questions about copyright. So fair use, fair use is something we hear about a lot in higher education. And it's a legal doctrine that promotes freedom of expression by permitting the unlicensed use of copyright protected works in certain circumstances. So section 107 of the Copyright Act itself provides the statutory framework 
um, for determining whether something is a fair use and identify certain types of uses such as criticism, comment, news reporting, uh, teaching, scholarship, research. Uh, examples of these types of activities may qualify for fair use. So section 107 calls for consideration of four factors in evaluating a question of fair use. And those four factors are listed here on the slide for you. Purpose, nature, amount, and effect. So how do you know if something is truly usable under fair use? Let's take a look at a scenario here. As most of you know, the cost of textbooks can be burdensome to some students. In an effort to help students, many professors try to limit textbook costs and um, either by not using a textbook or making a textbook available online. In this scenario, uh, Professor Jones would like to help keep the cost down for the students by scanning the entire textbook and placing it in, law, in the library's e-reserve system. The access to this digitized version would be password protected and limited to enrolled students in the class. The scan itself would come from a lawfully obtained copy. Would this be considered fair use? If you would, um, Aaron is going to offer up a poll and I am curious to see what you think. Would this be considered fair use or not? And these are very typical questions that Sue and I see um, when instructors are kind of going over and trying to determine how to make the best decision. All right, so it looks like most people said no, the majority, 84%. So thank you for taking the time to go through that poll. Um, the answer, in all fairness, if I, there we go, is it depends. Um, according to fair use, there are four factors, as we talked about a minute ago. Um, in this instance, because the professor wants to copy the entire work, I would surmise that if a lawsuit were brought against the institution and the professor, the judge would probably not find in their favor. A reasonable amount to copy would be considerably less than 100%. So typically it's less than 10% of a work. And that is even of a chapter of a work sometimes. So um, again, there are no hard and fast rules. It's up to a judge. So the answer truly is it depends, but my guess is, is a judge would say 100% is not reasonable. So let's talk about some options then. So options you might consider in a similar situation. You might check to see if the work you're wanting to use is already a part of your library's licensed content. Um, if so, a fair use analysis really isn't needed. Um, your best plan is to link to the material that could be found within your library databases. So, you know, JSTOR is a, a prime example of one that might have, or EBSCO might have some of this material already licensed for you to use. Uh, this puts the onus on the institution who posted the content and not on the instructor. You should only use, again, the amount of work that is necessary to meet a specific learning objective as well. And you should keep documentation in your course file so that you can show you carefully considered your use. Use a fair use checklist, uh, print out your results and keep it on file. Um, I've listed here a tiny URL. Um, and again, this presentation will be made available later, but Columbia University Libraries has a great PDF version of a fair use checklist that you can use and print out and keep in a course file. That way, if anybody ever did question your fair use, you can at least show that you did your due diligence in your consideration. So let's take a look at another scenario, another popular one. Um, Professor Smith has always shown a full length movie in his class or in her class. She has a DVD of the movie and would like to have it digitized so that she can show it in Blackboard, the LMS. Um, her only concern is that students could potentially pirate the video. 
Again, the stream would be password protected and in the LMS and limited to only the enrolled students. The original DVD would be kept in her course file. Do you consider this a fair use of copyrighted material? I will have Erin open the poll and I'm curious to see your responses. This is one that I think has been a pretty hot topic recently with our fast transition to all courses having to be online. And so um, it's come up several times. All right, so we have a good split here, um, but still 71% feel the answer is probably going to be no. And so let's take a look at the answer. I'll see if I can get my slide to advance. There we go. It depends is the answer again. Um, there are rules different in face-to-face -face classes versus online for showing movies and videos. Um, in a face-to-face, -face, they can show it, an uh, instructor can show a movie live and it's not recorded and at the risk of being downloaded by a student. Online, there is always the chance that a student could download and distribute an entire work. Um, although, honestly, that's not in our control. Uh, copyright owners are certainly more concerned once a work is digitized that it could be distributed nefariously. Um, here are some questions you may want to consider if you were to make a similar decision. Have you tried to obtain permissions from the original owner? Um, if not, that's always a good place to start. Um, although that process can sometimes be frustrating and time consuming, so um, you have to allow enough time in your process to be able to contact someone. Um, how much of the movie do you wish to digitize? More than likely, 100% would not meet the fair use guidelines in a court of law. Um, does the amount tie to a learning objective? Is the DVD encoded? A lot of times they are so that um, they prevent copying. Do you truly need to have it digitized and stream it? Or is it potentially available on YouTube for you to use? Many times you can find a work already posted online. You may want to look at your library's resources, such as Films on Demand. A lot of times you'll find great movies there that your institution already has obtained copyright access to. If it's not available there, Many times instructors will have students watch an entire work through a paid service such as Amazon Prime or Netflix or Hulu. Um, this way the student may have to pay to watch it, but it's not violating any copyright laws. Um, if you're concerned about cost and copyright infringement, you can also check YouTube. Many times a version of a work is also already available on YouTube. Uh, in this case, the responsibility for copyright does fall on the original uploader. The downside is if the work was posted illegally, the person who posted it um, could receive a cease and desist notice and it could be removed either by the original uploader um, or the original owner of the work if the upload is a violation of their copyright. So if you're counting on a link to be there, YouTube certainly isn't um, the most reliable in terms of it being there, especially if you're concerned that the work um, may not have been published with the appropriate um, copyright permissions. So there was a case in which um, UCLA was sued by Ambrose Video Publishing and the plaintiffs contended that UCLA acted illegally. They copied all of their DVDs of Shakespeare plays acquired from Ambrose and streamed them online for faculty and students through their library. Um, the UCL, UCLA argued that streaming the videos uh, was permissible under the fair use principle, which can allow reproductions for teaching and the TEACH Act, which allows limited use of copyrighted materials for online education. Um, one of those factors that weighed in favor of not finding fair use, again, the judge wrote, because they were using the entire work the entire work was streamed, not just portions. But on balance, that same judge said, the court concludes there is at a minimum ambiguity as to whether the defendant streaming constitutes fair use. 
Um, notably, no court has considered whether streaming videos only to students enrolled in a class constitutes fair use. So again, it's ambiguous enough that 100% probably is not going to um, weigh in, in your favor in a court of law. It is really up to the interpretation of the judge at that time and having all of your ducks in a row, having your documentation there can be really critical to proving that you have done your due diligence in your considerations. So a few we have a couple really quick questions that are kind of pertinent. Absolutely. So I, I kind of figured this is topic is a hot one. All right. I work at a school with very strict rules about the look of all our materials, including colors. Do you have tips for helping those staff know and understand the need to adhere to the guidelines you just covered on accessibility? So I think the first thing I would do would be make sure that their strict rules are within the guidelines for accessibility, um, depending on the colors, because it really is the law. So it's the strict rules. If their strict rules are adhering to the accessibility, then you really don't have an argument. If their strict rules are not adhering to accessibility, then by law, they would have to change them. Um, and there's really not an argument as to not changing them. Um, so it depends on what their look is and, and the colors of their look. Um, ladies, do you wanna weigh in on that real quick? Yep, you covered it. I think you covered it well. Okay, the next one um, from McDaniel. Terrific info on accessibility considerations. I'm just a faculty person without access to an instructional designer. Okay. Well, you do have access today, so it's your lucky day. This all seems overwhelming. How can I do all of this? It is overwhelming and, you know, it, it can be a lot to take in. I would strongly suggest that you do some checking online for um, articles and websites that can help you with accessibility, such as WAVE. Um, there's also WebAIM. I think, it, I think it's webaim.org. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go online, there will be all kinds of help for you. And if you have questions, you know, that maybe Susan and I can help answer quickly for you, um, we would certainly be willing to do that. So don't be afraid to reach out to either one of us after this is over. Yes, and all of our contact info will be available at the end. Um, and you can contact them, myself, any of us um, as, as resources um, to help. At other and there will well. be another resource here coming up that will help you as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just know you are not alone mm -mm. in having that trepidation with working with alt tags and transcripts and things of that nature. It can be very overwhelming. <laughs> Right, right. And that, that's why ASPPH is helping to do this because you're not alone. A lot of people are in the same boat and, you know, that's we're here to help and they're here to help and, you know, we're kind of all a community. Um, so all of this extreme information is extremely valuable. I've never been told about any of it. Who should be responsible for helping us faculty know what we need to be doing? Theoretically, it would be your instructional design team. And if you don't have that, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I would also say a lot of times teaching and learning centers mm -hmm. cover this type of information with faculty. Um, Office of Disability yes. would also help. Um, it's just, there just may a little be. bit of everybody. It's pretty much the whole, the whole learning community. Um, last question. How do you build the online community that encourage students to interact with the coffee shop? So our coffee shops are not graded. Um, some of them are more interactive than others. A lot of it actually depends on the faculty. What we've seen is how engaged the faculty member is in the coffee shop is a direct result of how engaged the students are involved in the coffee shop. So if we have a faculty member that poses a lot of questions like tell me something interesting about yourself or tell me three truths and one lie. Um, things like that, and they start interacting with the students on, you know, a personal level. Um, the coffee shops are very engaged. If the faculty member just says, hey, introduce yourself in the coffee shop and not much activity, then they're not engaged. So it definitely depends on the faculty member in the course as to the engagement of the students. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. If, you know, if the faculty member stays engaged in the coffee shop, the students do as well. Okay. And this question is to ASPPH. Beyond making this program available, would you be open to a school taking the recording to use with our trainings, copyright laws? I'm not sure I understand that question. 
I think, I think yeah, that's our, our aim, it's Liz here. Our aim is for us to disseminate our members' excellent lessons learned, uh, experiences. This webinar is going to be archived, so you would be very welcome to, uh, to use it, take it, chunk it up into bite-sized chunks as you wish. All yours. Yeah, and it will include speaker notes and seat calculations, everything. So we are including all the detail and you will have contact information in case you have further questions. All right, or, I'm gonna hand it back. If you'd, like, if you'd like us to come and do the same dog and pony show at your school, I think we could probably be convinced. <laughs> all right, ladies, Absolutely. I'm handing it back over to y'all. All right, well, thank you. <laughs> and great questions, keep them coming. Yeah. Um, I've got just a couple more things to talk about here, a, a takeaways about um, the scenarios we've talked about here for copyright. Um, if you're using copyrighted material under fair use, always conduct that fair use checklist. The portion of the work you use should only be the portion of the work critical to meet that learning objective. And if you're going to digitize a work, get permission before digitizing and calculate time to get those permissions in your timeline, if at all possible. Um, sometimes I know our librarians have reached out for permissions and sometimes it's hard to track people down to get permissions on videos. And so um, if, if at all possible, allow yourself time on that. If you're short on time, really check to see if it's already digitized and out there. In a lot of cases it is. Um, so, we talked about videos and books, but what about pictures and audio clips then? So there's kind of a good rule of thumb, just because you can Google it doesn't mean it's copyright free. And I do see this quite a bit, all joking aside, um, even in courses where people grab a cartoon clip off the internet that's out there, it's an image they found on Google, so they think it's free to use and it's probably not. Um, you know, there are copyright free searches that you can do. And so that can be important. When in doubt, the best rule of thumb is don't use it without permissions. There are copyright free images available. Creative Commons is a great place to find um, images that are copyright free. <laughs> Using audio files is another consideration. Um, the concept of copy royalty free music could be a webinar in and of itself. Um, but you don't have, if you don't have permissions to use the music, say, as a background, if you're creating a video, make your own. You can use GarageBand or Audacity to kind of make some little royalty-free video or audio clips. Um, and you can also purchase royalty-free tracks. Um, think about Muzak or Elevator Music to use in the background. Um, there are companies that even your library may have resources available for checkout that are royalty free music to use. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it back to Sue to talk to us a little bit about Carnegie and seat time. Oh yes, this is, this is like our, our big thing here because you know the Carnegie unit is a time-based measurement of educational attainment. So generally schools will measure a credit with the formula of one hour in class time plus two hours outside the class per week equals one credit. So if a class meets three times a week for one hour each time, it's a three credit course. And in the online world, it's kind of challenging to calculate that when you don't have an equivalent face-to-face -face class. And if you do, just for accreditation purposes, the amount of work and the content should be relatively the same in both delivery methods. But we don't have equivalent residential college courses in our college. Everything we do is online. So we were faced with this challenge a few years ago as our HLC accreditation was approaching. Our associate dean along with the um, instructional designers, the program chairs, some faculty members came up with a formula, actually several formulas, to calculate work in an online course. For instance, for a discussion forum, we asked the course developer to give us the number of words expected in the initial post, the number of words expected in response posts, and the minimum number of response posts required. And this can vary from one discussion to another in a course because, as you know, some questions foster much more discussion than others. And this allows us to plug those numbers into a formula and come up with an approximate workload calculation. 
So, and everything's a little bit skewed here today because um, nothing ever translates beautifully and seamlessly to online now, does it? So in this case, um, for that initial post, we calculate that for every 250 words that a student has to create, they're gonna spend about 60 minutes of preparation time. And then to type those 250 words, about 20 words per minute. So that would take 12 and a half minutes. So 72 and a half for the initial post. We also assume in our formula that that prep time includes also learning what they need to do to respond to their classmates. So that prep time encompasses both. Um, and then they will type, again, about 20 words a minute. They have to do four responses. So their response posts are gonna take them about 30 minutes to create. Then we look at, um, we look, include the time it takes to read the initial posts and the response posts of other students in the course. We use a standard number of 15 students in a course, although most of our courses don't have quite that many students. Um, reading 14 initial posts, reading 56 response posts, adding up all those portions comes to 168.5 minutes or 2.8 hours. And then we calculate that for everything a student does in a course, except for reading the module introductions and checking grades. <laughs> it's overwhelming. This overwhelmingly complicated and yet at the same time it makes a lot of sense. So we have similar formulas for writing assignments such as papers, blogs, journals, wikis. Uh, these include time for reading instructor feedback as well. For textbooks and journal readings, we allowed about five minutes per page. If an article is on the internet, we copy and paste that text into a Word document divide the total number of words by 250, and we get a page count, and we always round up. So if the calculation comes out to say 3.24, we count four pages. Uh, a website is a page that includes links for the students to explore, and we give them about 20 minutes for that. And then videos, of course, one minute of watching equals one minute of work. We started this process late in 2016, and we've tweaked it a bit recently for um, different difficulty levels of certain writing assignments and readings. Our registrar has determined that our courses need to have 135 hours of work, and we use a plus or minus target of 10%. So our three credit courses have between 121 and a half hours and 148 and a half hours of work. We've been very successful in using this method to make sure that we have enough work in our courses and the HLC was really impressed with these efforts. But um, the entire system itself is way too complicated to get into in this presentation. Heck, we could do an entire presentation on just that. Um, so if you'd like to read more, our Associate Dean, Dr. Katherine Adler, published an article about it in the online journal of Distance Learning Administration. Her article, Determining Carnegie Units, Student Engagement in Online Courses Without a Residential Equivalent, is in the Spring 2020 issue. Whew. Right. <laughs> That's a we lot have, of stuff. We have covered a lot of things. So this has probably been a lot to take in, especially if you joined us on Tuesday as well. Um, we've thrown a lot of information at you in a hurry. And honestly, I think We've all been feeling a little overwhelmed the past three months now. Um, so once you log out of the session, where else can you go for help? Of course, you're always welcome to contact any one of us. We'll list our contact information. Um, but we rounded up some resources for help and want to share them with you now. So one of them, if you haven't already subscribed to, Faculty Focus is a website dedicated to higher education. It offers a free newsletter with articles on effective teaching strategies for both online and residential classrooms. It offers an email newsletter that is published two to three times a week, uh, covering topics such as academic leadership, um, blended and flipped learning, course design, assessment, classroom management, uh, effective teaching strategies, um, teaching with technology, and a lot more. 
Um, I've also found some very useful reports on the faculty focus site, including a whole section on online course design um, that includes a resource guide for transitioning your class online. Um, also one called 11 strategies for managing your online course and another one called promoting academic integrity in online education. Uh, another resource um, if you're not already a member of, Sue mentioned this earlier, we send our courses through Quality Matters for a review. Um, so you may want to find out if your courses or your institution subscribes to Quality Matters. Um, Quality Matters started as a grant funded project to determine how to measure and guarantee the quality of an online course. And QM certification is based on an entire peer review process. And as Sue can tell you, as a QM coordinator, um, that process can be very in-depth. Um, they have an entire rubric full of expectations for each online course, um, including um, sections on course overview and introduction. They look at learning objectives, assessment and measurement, all of the instructional materials, um, learning activities, learner interaction in the course. Um, technology, learner support, accessibility, as we've talked about today, and usability. Um, and so um, there's just a lot on the Quality Matters site that you can find that could be helpful if your institution is a subscriber. If you're not a subscriber, though, even, right now, Quality Matters is offering an emergency remote instruction checklist for higher ed. So, um, if you're not a subscriber to Quality Matters, right now you can access um, some of the very helpful tools to help you get your courses quickly transitioned from face-to-face -face class to online. Uh, and so that guide is helpful. And we've listed a URL for you here. Again, this resource will be published later so you'll be able to access um, that information as well. Uh, we were talking earlier about where can I go for help if we don't have an instructional designer? This is one of those places where you can go. Um, the Instructional Design Emergency Response Network website is a great place to go to get help. So this site was established just in March and more than 500 people like Sue and myself um, can offer assistance to educators all over the world. So it says that right now there are is more than 3,000 years of combined experience just waiting to help. So if you need help, reach out. That's what this network is for. If you are a member of Facebook, I strongly encourage you to join this Higher Ed Learning Collective group. Um, there are tons of resources out there, people who share your situation, um, as we've said, Sue and I have said, you can laugh, cry, commiserate together. People share their um, success stories. Um, they share communications with their students with each other. They also share their horror stories and what not to do. Um, but it's a great collective group, um, a great support group, if nothing else. And if you use any type of technology, um, you might find the e-learning heroes community helpful as well. So this is put on by Articulate. Um, they offer products such as Articulate 360. Some of you may already be familiar with, um, but this site includes lots of helpful articles um, such as five fantastic ideas for keeping learners on the edge of their seats, um, 17 e-learning makeover designs, um, and just a wide variety that's out there. If you go to the downloads page, you'll find templates and images that you can use if you're a community member. And if you're not, it's free to be a community member. So just another site I would strongly encourage you to take a look at. So if you have any questions, certainly here is our contact information. And um, we are happy to help you in any way, shape, or form. Um, we, are, we are here for you. You don't have to go through this alone. If this is the first time you're hearing some of this information, reach out. We really would be happy to talk with you more. So at this point, I think we want to open it up for questions and feel free to ask away. I 
think we're just about out of time. So let's go ahead and turn it over to Liz. And if you do have any questions, please make sure to reach out to us via email. We'll be more than happy to uh, field whatever questions you might have. Thank you so much for attending today. Thank you. Hearty appreciation to our amazing moderator and our two instructional designer presenters. I do feel like you gave us a week long course in one hour. That is a true skill. I think that I'm gonna need to watch the archived webinar a couple times slowly to really absorb all the excellent instruction guidance and tips you gave us. So the archived recording will be available on the website usually within about 24 hours. We'll make sure that everyone gets the link so you could review it again. We do offer one hour of continuing ed credits for the CPH that you can uh, achieve by reporting it in your portal. If you could hang on just an extra 30 seconds when we finish, it is one question with five parts asking how well that we delivered the promised learning outcomes. We'd really appreciate it. It's gonna pop up right in your browser when you close out of the webinar. So just sit tight and it'll shoot in there. We do have some webinars coming up. They're still in progress, so we don't have the names and dates quite yet, but they are gonna be available uh, on our website at the site you see there. We look forward to seeing you again and hearing from you. It's been terrific sharing this time with you today, and now the webinar is adjourned. <laughs>